Dear guests, welcome back. I hope you had a good coffee break and had some time to maybe digest and discuss what you've heard so far today. After speaking about the transatlantic relations, we will now take a closer look at China. The 20th National Congress, currently ongoing, of the Chinese Communist Party is a crystallization point that will shape the course of the country for years. China is facing a rapid economic slowdown with a fin crumbling financial market, demographic problems, and the pandemic. Besi besides that, the war in Ukraine has put China in a difficult international position. While we are seeing new momentum for the transatlantic relations, as we just heard, the uh, relations between China and the West are in a difficult position as we already heard this morning in the panel. The risk of conflict and escalation increases and must be taken seriously. Reason enough to ask, where is China headed? A good question for which we have an even better conversation partner. Hi. <laughs> Mr. Kevin Rudd, he's former prime minister of Australia and now President and CEO of the Asia Society. And for this conversation, I hand over to Nora Müller, our executive director. Thank you, Nora. Alisa, thank you very much. Yes, indeed. Um, the current 20th CPC Party Congress is a historical one already. Xi Jinping kicked it off with a two hour long speech or so on Sunday. And we will try on this panel to make sense of what is currently going on in the Great Hall of the People in Beijing and much more. And I, I dare say we have the perfect interlocutor for this conversation here with us. By the way, to those of you here in the audience and online as well, if you want to join this conversation, go to hashtag Berlin Forum and post your questions and comments. Kevin, you've been watching party congresses in China for the better part of your adult life, if I may say so. I think your first party congress was the 12th one, which was in, in um, 1982. And I would presume that the current 20th one is probably one of the more consequential ones. Now, um, we have Xi Jinping seeking to get reelected for a third term and thereby de facto abolishing the principle of collective leadership. That's one thing. But if that weren't enough, what would you say, what are other reasons for us to take a very close look at what's going on in Beijing as we speak? Good. Well, thank you for the question. It's good to be back in Berlin. I was only here a month or two ago. So, and good to be here with Kerber Stiftung and our friends at the uh, German Foreign Ministry. Uh, the re and you're right, I have been looking at party congresses since the 12th party congress, uh, which makes me start to feel very old. So, in fact, I was a young Australian diplomat in our embassy and starting in 1984. Um, and, uh, and since then, whatever I've been doing in life, I've tried to remain engaged with internal Chinese politics, the Chinese Communist Party, because it's complex. Um, the reason we should pay attention to a party congress is this. It's not just that they happen every five years. It's not just that they elect or select uh, the party general secretary, membership of the Politburo, membership of the standing committee, that's all true. What's really important is that it establishes the ideological parameters, the ideological framework within which the party and the state operate for the next five years. It is the best predictor of what happens in the real world of economic policy, of foreign and security policy, and frankly, of domestic politics as well. So for me, that's what's important. And my only other comment at the beginning of our conversation today is it's really important for friends around the world to understand that when Xi Jinping's leadership frames their ideological worldview, 
it is predominantly through the frame of Marxism-Leninism. Marxism-Leninism is not just a piece of political camouflage from the past, as it was for many people analyzing the Deng Xiaoping period, the Jiang Zemin period, the Hu Jintao period. That is, Marxism-Leninism on the outside as a piece of um, ideological clothing, but on the inside, a uh, bustling semi-capitalist economy and society. That, in fact, is a fair summary of the period 82 to 2017. But Xi Jinping has reinvented ideology. Uh, the piece that I've just written for Foreign Affairs magazine, based on my own research, def defines it as the return of ideological man. And therefore, do, we need to take Marxist-Leninist frameworks of analysis seriously, because when I look at his Congress report, a huge slab of that report is purely about Marxism-Leninism. It is purely about dialectical materialism. It is purely about historical materialism. It is purely about the concept of struggle and advancing progress. This has not been in the Congress reports of 1982, 1987, 1992, 1997, 2002, or the rest. This is new, and we've begun to see this trend line emerging from 2017, the last party Congress, but it's much stronger this time. I define Xi Jinping as a Marxist nationalist. Both elements of the ideology are clear, and seeing him as just a nationalist without being a Marxist-Leninist is wrong. And the other, and the other seeing way him just as, well. as a Marxist-Leninist with not being a nationalist is wrong as well. He is both these things, and these two ideological visions drive his political and policy agenda. And since you mentioned policy, Kevin, let me come in with an additional question here. I mean, um, listening to, to what Xi Jinping had to say, he mentioned a lot of national security in his speech. He talked about doubling down on China's zero COVID policy. He talked about economic progress in spite of the dire situation that fi China finds itself in economically, even paid lip service to reform and opening. And of course, he also talked about Taiwan and how, and I'm here, I'm quoting, the wheels of history are rolling on toward China's reunification. So when you talk about ideology on the one hand, what does all of that mean for concrete policy? I mean, what, what kind of policy or policy changes will we see coming out of this party congress? Yeah, it's important to see ideological statements as constituting the headwaters of a stream. And the downstream you then see in six, 12, 18 months time, the policy articulation and development of the ideological parameters which have been set at the beginning. And this work report is being drafted for the last six to nine months mm -hmm. in mon microscopic detail, word by word, phrase by phrase, paragraph by paragraph. It's not just some, you know, speechwriter at the chancellery who says, oh, well, let's do a speech, you know. It ain't like that. This is, this is like drafting the communique of the Council of Trent um, in the Counter-Reformation. People take this very seriously. Let me answer your question by saying what it means for the economy, and let's go on to talk about mm. the external agenda mm -hmm. a bit later yep. in our conversation. All of us in this room, whether you're from industry or whether you're from government or from think tanks, know that for several years now, the Chinese economy has been slowing. Um, in our analysis in the Asia Society Policy Institute and our Center for China Analysis, there are four big causes of this. One's demography the demographic overhang, aging population, shrinking workforce, etc. But the second is ideology, mm. which is... This Marxist trend. In yeah, and mm. so what does that mean in real terms? It's not just words. It means more space for the state-owned sector, less space for the private sector. It means more role for the party in the regulation of private firms, including senior personnel appointments. Uh, it means a much greater role for state industrial policy uh, to take command uh, of science and technology innovation than leaving it where it was until recent times, largely with the private sector. Jack Ma, JD, DD, Tencent, and all those brilliant, bright, 
innovative Chinese firms uh, that I've been dealing with for 20, 30 years in one form or another. And so in the balance between the state and the market, since 2017, Xi Jinping has moved the pendulum closer to the state and further away from the market. This document uh, doesn't correct it back to the center mm -hmm. towards the market. It leaves it to the Marxist left rather than returning to a more market orientation. And there's one other point I'll mention on the economy. When 96 million Chinese Communist Party members read this uh, report, and they read it like the Bible, um, because it sh determines what you can do. Uh, they will look at it and they will say, there is much more emphasis in this report on security than the economy. One small example, my staff did this word count uh, back in the 12th Party Congress. Your first one? Yeah. The term economy, just jingji, the Chinese phrase, or jingji fajia, economic development, was used 195 times in the report. By the time Xi Jinping uh, becomes, uh, delivers his first party congress report in 2017, it's good down to 70, mm -hmm. and this one is now down to 60. Um, whereas the references to other things, uh, like uh, national security, and the references to Marxism, and references to building a powerful state, Chiangguo, uh, have all gone up. So there's a second argument, which is not just about the direction of economic policy, whether it's pro-market or pro-state. Uh, it is also an argument about the centrality of the economy over security as well. These are the two trends that I see coming out of this 20th Party Congress report. That's super interesting, and I do want to touch upon the external dimension of things in a moment, but one question to follow up on, on the economy part of things. So if, if, if that sort of Marxist trend will continue, and if priority is given to um, security issues over economy, that's what you pretty much described, then doesn't she run the risk of alienating the Chinese population in the sense that, you know, what is a sort of an unwritten social contract might be broken. Up, up until now, it was sort of the, 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 the uh, agreement that the state, the party provides for growth and economic success, and on the other sa side, people just, you know, um, keep quiet and, and agree to whatever the party or the state does. So is, do, are you is, is there going to be an imbalance in, 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 in that sense? Yeah, I don't think Rousseau and Voltaire had this in mind with the social contract, but the Communist Party's social contract is we give you economic growth, you give us your political rights. That's the contract. Exactly, that's um, what I mean. And uh, it's important we understand that. So it's one of the reasons why when folks like myself have been analysing this move to the left on the economy over the last five years, I've been writing on this fairly consistently, um, is that given the collapse in growth numbers from what we all assumed was the norm for the 2020s, of something in around 5 to 6% growth down to 3 to 4% growth, down to 2 to 3% growth, sub-trend, which is not desirable for an economy which is still a low middle-income economy. It should be much higher than that. Many of us have assumed that because of that, this Congress would provide him with the classic opportunity for course correction. What I see from the text is that he has not done that. Mm. Uh, he's stayed the course in where he's got to already on the tilt to the state and the party and the tilt to security over the economy and the tilt to Marx and national power. So is it sustainable, which is your core question, Remember, the Chinese Communist Party is now equipped with vast surveillance apparatus, vast control apparatus, facial re recognition technologies, the ability to track people's social media behavior, etc. cetera. Um, and therefore, the ability to do anything by way of effective dissent uh, is now much more limited than it used to be. If you ask any China analyst who's been looking at Chinese domestic politics this core question, who could organize 
sufficient dissent within the Communist Party to cause Xi Jinping to change course on the economy, let alone organize something more fundamental by way of opposition uh, against Xi Jinping, none of us can identify such a person or group of persons. That may change as social forces unfold, but if you ask me the question now, I can't see it. Hmm. Thanks very much for this. Well, um, let's shift focus a moment towards the external side of things. Um, uh, we mentioned Taiwan already um, and what Xi Jinping said about it in his speech at the Party Congress. So, um, you know, from what I understand, there seems to be a pretty clear timetable for what he has in mind with Taiwan. And the one sort of the one million dollar question that gets asked all the time is when China looks at what currently goes on with Ukraine and the Western reaction towards Ukraine, what are the kind of lessons that the Chinese leadership might draw from this when it comes to the issue of Taiwan, if any. I understand you're a bit skeptical on that argument and you say, well, they, they might stay co course after all. Yeah, I mean, I think the general Chinese view of Vladimir Putin is that he's a bit of a dummy. <laughs> um, you're gonna have a war. Uh, Article one of Sun Tzu's Art of War, Sun Tzu Bingfa says, uh, one of the Chinese military classics says, war is a great matter of state not to be taken lightly. If you lose the war, you lose the state. That was written about 300 BC. But every Chinese leader knows that in the back of their head. And so they look at Putin and say, so you're gonna invade this country which you claim to be yours. Um, okay. Um, we assume you've got overwhelming force to deliver this military and political objective. Well, you didn't. Uh, you didn't make yourself economically and financially resilient. Um, this is looking bad. Mm. Can I back up a bit, though, uh, from Ukraine and just dwell for one minute on this? Going back to the 20th Party Congress, what for me is new on foreign and security policy at large is something we should focus on, given that we're at a German foreign ministry conference. <laughs> and also a Kura conference. And, uh, yeah, well, you, you can sort out your Stiftung later. I, uh, I get them all mixed up. Now I know who Kerber is, it's fine. But it's a bit like this. Um, if you've been looking at these Congress reports, which are ideologically significant for the last 30 years, which is kind of what I've been doing, uh, more than that now, there's been a phrase which has been around and embedded in these documents uh, since the 80s, which simply says something like this, uh, which is peaceful development is the main trend of our times. What does that mean? It means that we do not foresee any foreign wars that impact us. We do not see even less any wars which would directly engage us. We can therefore focus our resources and our efforts on the development of the economy and gradually increasing our foreign policy influence and footprint. For the first time uh, in 20 to 30 years, uh, that phrase has been dropped from this Congress report. Read through a Chinese lens internally, and this document's not designed for us, it's designed for the party. Our job is to try and interpret it, but it's designed for a domestic audience. It's saying we don't have that as a conclusion anymore. Furthermore, there's another phrase which is uh, China is currently in a period of strategic opportunity. What does that mean? It means that, again, we don't see any foreign wars coming up which are going to directly affect us or which will involve us. And we have a strategic opportunity to continue to dedicate all our resources to the development of the economy. That phrase has been dropped. These two omissions are significant because my interpretation of it and I haven't had time to read anyone else's interpretation of it, I tend to just go off the primary documents and just read it and compare it with what's been there in the past, is what Xi Jinping is signaling to us through this party, his work report, is the Communist Party looking at the growing uh, response, strategic response from the United States and its allies in the world, uh, is saying, for the five years ahead, uh, we in China begin to, to need to make a range of new national security preparations for the possibility of armed conflict. 
That is new. That has not been in their central documents before. And the second thing is, if you look to the section of the document dealing specifically with the military, it calls for, I stayed up all night a few nights ago reading this bloody thing, the, um, uh, it calls for on the question of the PLA that there should be uh, increased capacity of the army to win, increased proportion of new combat forces and promoting actual combat military training. Those are new phrases as well. Interestingly, though, and I'll finish on this, the language on Taiwan uh, is relatively conciliatory compared with the past. Uh, it says that um, China's firm response recently is only targeted on that small minority of people who are Taiwan independence activists and their foreign backers, meaning the United States. Um, though it does caution the Taiwanese to say that the forces of historical materialism the great trends of history are grinding forward towards the inevitability of reunification. That's putting them on notice. Mm. And the only thing he said definitive about the timetable for that is not in this document, but what he said before, is that you cannot achieve China's ambition, nationalist ambition, of being the preeminent regional and global power unless reunification is achieved with Taiwan. And the, the target date for that is 2049. <laughs> I would love for you, um, Kevin, to say a word or two about what you think should be done to sort of keep strategic stability in the Taiwan Strait. But um, maybe we can come to that a little later or even in the Q&A part of things. And with a look to my watch, I do want to ask you about Germany and China and, and what you think about this, you know, complex relationship and a sort of a good occasion to, to sort of address is Chancellor Schultz's um, trip to Beijing in early November. Um, he'll be, I think, the first G7 leader to go to um, China after the outbreak of the pandemic. So in light of everything you said so far in terms of China's development and where the country is headed, what do you think, what are the kind of messages that Schultz should bring with him to Beijing? Well, I'm aware that the chancellor and the government here are seeking to develop Germany's first national security strategy and its first China strategy. I've been in uh, Berlin before talking to friends and colleagues uh, in the government and think tank community about these questions. And so my sense of the government from those discussions is that they are fully seized of, frankly, the complexity of everything we've just been discussing. Mm. Uh, there's no deep mystery in terms of the challenge they face. Um, the second point I'd make, which I've made to them privately, and I'll make it here publicly, is often uh, um, Germany um, underestimates its significance in the eyes of the Chinese leadership. Don't do that. When the Chinese leadership look at Europe, they look primarily at this country. Um, may cause me discomfort to say that in Paris, in front of a French audience, but I've just been in Paris and I'm now in Berlin. But the reality, having dealt with Chinese political leaders and diplomats over many decades, is that there is a deep view that uh, the German, Germany, uh, the German economy, Germany's role in the European Union, Germany's role in NATO, makes Germany a highly significant power. In the same way that they don't look at too many other powers around the world. Many Germans are quite uncomfortable when I say that, as if to say, but that's not really us. I'm just saying that's the reality as you're perceived. And therefore, when the chancellor goes to, to uh, Beijing, uh, he should be mindful that what he says will carry weight. And what he does will carry weight because it will be the first significant engagement that Xi Jinping has had with any Western political leader mm. uh, face to face, probably since the beginning of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. He's been to Central Asia once uh, for a meeting of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization where again he met Vladimir the Impaler, that wasn't such a happy meeting. Um, but uh, as he tries to distance himself more from what Putin has done in Ukraine. But the, the, the German message uh, is not a trivial matter, it's a very important matter. And in addition to realizing that Germany does matter also for Beijing in terms of substance, what, he, what should he tell Xi Jinping? Well, I'm always reluctant, uh, as a former diplomat myself, to provide public pontification. I thought you'd say that, but still. Public pontification 
uh, to uh, another government when I'm in their town uh, about what they should and shouldn't do. So let me make some general remarks rather than those which are specifically directed at what the Chancellor or the Foreign Minister should be doing. I'm going to see the Foreign Minister straight after this, so I'm very mindful of the day. Um, and I saw the Chancellor when I was last year. Um, I think the truth is uh, Germany, like the rest of us, as allies of the United States, need to have a very clear-eyed view that China and Russia, for a number of years now, at least since the first Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2014, have developed um, a uh, common strategic view of the world. The idea that uh, Beijing has a different strategic view of the world than, uh, than Russia, I think, is largely analytically flawed. If you want evidence of that, look carefully through the text of the 4 February Joint Strategic Framework agreed to by both Putin and Xi Jinping in Beijing on the eve of the Olympics and two weeks before the invasion of Ukraine. That was the strategic framework without limits. Mm -hmm. So if there is an assumption here in Berlin or more broadly in Europe, and I've just uh, been in Brussels myself, that somehow uh, Xi Jinping has a worldview radically different from that which we see in the Russian Federation, I don't think that is necessarily the case. Secondly, uh, reading again carefully what Xi Jinping says in the 20th Party Congress, he says that it's time now to build a new international system. Uh, an international system which is more just, an international system which is more multipolar, an international system which is frankly more respectful uh, of Chinese power, values and interests. That's my interpretation, not explicitly what he says. But the program in terms of new concepts for an international order where you see the redefinition of the term human rights in a state sovereignty direction, the redefinition of the term democracy or minju uh, in, the, in the direction of so-called um, performative uh, democracy as opposed to electoral democracy. Uh, this is a project already well underway in international institutions around the world. If we were to have your permanent representative of the United Nations sitting on this platform here at the moment, they'd give you list after list after list, resolution after resolution after resolution where this debate is now being had every day. So the reason I emphasize this is that Chancellor Schultz and the German government will need to be very mindful that the international order which is being constructed is vastly different from the one of which we have been party to uh, since uh, 1945. Um, and people will reach their own conclusions about whether it's good, bad or indifferent, but China is embarking now on a radically different course. My final point is, for any of us dealing with China, and this is very much the Australian experience, um, though since I left office, is that there is always, uh, with those of us who are liberal democracies around the world, whether we are Asian democracies or European democracies, or North American democracies or Latin American democracies, it's very important for China to know that there is a combined position among the democracies on these key questions, not just of strategic stability, but also the universality of human rights and democracy as well. China is a past master at picking individual states mm -hmm. off. Uh, punitive measures, coercive uh, economic diplomacy against Australia is kind of a case study, but they've done the same with the Norwegians in the past, they've done the same with the Swedes in a different respect, they've done the same with the South Koreans. So in taking a position, whatever its content is to Beijing, the German government needs to be very mindful of the fact, speaking with the strength of representing a broad uh, strategy to, which embraces the democratic world at large, but also our common interest as allies of the United States in particular, is fundamentally important. It also safeguards Germany's long-term interests. That note, that point is well taken. Thank you very much, Kevin. Let's have a full stop here because the issue of China 
is so important for German policymakers and also German politicians, um, we thought we'd invite a, another German voice um, to this panel here. I am very happy that Jürgen Hart agreed to follow our invitation to react to Kevin Rudd with a five-minute interjection. For those of you who don't know, Jürgen Hart is the foreign policy spokesman of the CDU-CSU faction in the German Bundestag. We are very happy to have him here. Jürgen Hart, the floor is yours. This is like the Oxford Debating Union. I don't know. It's very good. I'm all for it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nora Müller. Thank you very much, Excellency, that we have the chance to share some thought with you, representing the country and also personal in your function as Prime Minister responsible for politics in Australia, which already made some experience, some tough experience with China that probably we in Germany and Europe have to face in the future. Um, I have done some notes, but I think it's better to react maybe on some, some things you have already have said. And we discussed before about the question, what do a German opposite politician thinking about the visit of, um, of uh, Olaf Scholz to um, China at the beginning of November? I say the German Federal Chancellor Angela Merkel was in China 12 times, when I'm right only in times of corona. She didn't travel in October. She normally traveled in October to China, always with a big business delegation. I also had the chance to go with her um, several years ago to China. And um, I saw what you already mentioned, that Germany uh, is in a special focus of China. Economic-wise, this is what I saw um, some years ago because Germany is, um, so to say, the miracle to combine, combine high um, um, income of laborers, high standards in social welfare, uh, and high um, uh, cost in production, with competitiveness on the international market, which comes mainly from the education and training of our employees. And this is something where China wants to copy and paste because they know that they have to fulfill the expectation of their people that the um, Chinese Communist Party is delivering welfare to the people. And this is only possible if they um, uh, see some new ways to, to um, become more competitive and more uh, on the quali quali quality level um, higher. This was um, um, my impression from that trip. And at that time, I think we did not yet, uh, at that time we didn't uh, already realize that uh, under Xi Jinping, uh, the combination of economic power and political power uh, became more and more important for the Chinese government. And if we look to the debate, for example, on, on 5G or um, um, other high technology like uh, artificial intelligence, we have to be aware that in Germany, in Europe, and also North America, if there's a business competition with China, maybe some projects ongoing, uh, we always need a business plan, a working business plan behind a pro program. Um, the state can give, sub give subventions, but at the end of the day, a private, private owned companies need to um, take the chance uh, for doing business with China or um, uh, doing something in the world. From the Chinese point of view, um, the fi final decision on doing business in Europe, for example, is uh, uh, done by the uh, head of the Department of Economy of the Communist Party. Um, and they are able to um, 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 uh, dump uh, into every market by uh, reducing prices. We saw that with 5G. We see that probably also uh, if you look to um, um, uh, uh, raw material, um, uh, raw mat minerals, for example, where Germany is depending um, up to 98 percent in some, some sectors um, from imports from China, uh, not because it, uh, these uh, materials are only available in China, but because they are the cheapest from China. And the reason for that is that the political government in China decided that uh, we should be attracted to buy Chinese and not Kazakh or, or Russian or, or African um, um, stuff. From my point of view, we need um, a, a, a more, more ambitious um, um, and more courageous approach to that Chinese challenge. Uh, the first leverage, I think, is that the Chinese government is depending on good trade relations to the rest of the world to, to fulfill the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, proposal of welfare for the people in China. 
and therefore they cannot risk the good trade relations to the Western world. So if we, Europeans, Americans, G7 together, we set um, a, a set of regulations, minimum standards uh, in our trade relations with China that we promote together, I think we have a good chance to reach some compromises with China. The second is that we should um, engage much more in um, um, attracting other states, neutral states, states in between from um, Southeast Asia, but for example also from Indi or India itself, to um, work closer with us. The Indians are very much afraid on the 3,500 uh, 3, kilometer border to China, which is not yet fixed um, with military uh, staff, or Chinese staff on the, um, on the uh, Chinese side of that border. And, and therefore we have a good chance now to find new friends. And I think this is one of the main objectives we should do in the future. Combine our um, um, powers in Europe and North America on China and attract other countries to come closer to us and to help us to, to face this challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jürgen Hart. He already has his little red book in his hand, whatever that may mean. <laughs> um, so, Kevin, if, if it's okay for you, I will open the floor to questions and comments, and if you'd like, you could also respond then to, yes, to sure. what Jürgen Hart Get has said. First, yeah. Fantastic. So, I do see a number of raised hands over here, and the gentleman in the back, um, whom I can, I think it's Janis Kluge. Um, so you, you're first, Janis. Thank you very much uh, for an excellent discussion. Um, my name is Janis Kluge. I work for the German Institute of International Security Affairs in Berlin. And my question is uh, related uh, to the war in Ukraine. Um, you emphasized once more the common strategic view of Russia and China and the partnership without limits. And I was wondering um, if this also extends uh, to nuclear threats, nuclear mm. escalation. Um, what is your understanding of Beijing's view on nuclear escalation, the risks, or more specifically, the frequent use of nuclear threats by Vladimir Putin? And is this something that um, Xi Jinping and Putin would be talking about? Thank you very much. Janis, thank you very much. If it's okay, Vic, Kevin, I will collect maybe one or two more questions. I saw one on the other side here. Yes, please. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. For Can you hear me or should I put down my mask? Okay, let's it's just, okay. Whatever let's just is go good this for way. You. Um, thank you very much for the excellent discussion. Um, I have a question. You said that China has a particular interest in Germany as a powerful voice in Europe. And I maybe want to turn around um, turn around your point and ask if China also sees an opportunity in Germany because Nord Stream 2 has provided a horrible example how Germany's economic interests have been used against voices from Eastern Europe and their security concerns to further our own economic agenda. So does China also see an opportunity to use Germany and its economic interests in its trade with China to maybe undermine common positions within the G7, within the EU, or within the transatlantic relationship. I think that point is well understood. And if I could, let me add a third question that has come in um, via Twitter. And here it is. Should the EU, NATO, and the Commonwealth contest the Belt and Road Initiative and compete with China in Africa and the Near East through strategic partnerships with developing countries, question mark. Kevin, we have China and, and nuclear escalation. We have China and does it see an opportunity in Germany? And we have contesting the Belt and Road Initiative. Yeah, thank you for those questions. They're very thoughtful. Let me start with Jürgen, my good friend from, my new good friend from the CDU, CSU. So, um, I've met many of your colleagues over many years. Um, uh, thank you for your reflective remarks. I would simply say in terms of German general strategy on responding to uh, the challenge of China's rise and all that that represents, both by way of opportunity and threat, that it's useful for democracies around the world, in particular allies of the United States, to have a common strategic framework, which is along these lines. Um, and you see some evidence of this emerging from Brussels anyway. There are areas with China where we must continue to cooperate. 
Uh, climate change collaboration is self-evident, but so is um, global financial stability. China's a huge financial system, capable of triggering a sovereign debt crisis amongst many countries at any given time, given the level of uh, Chinese um, loans to infrastructure projects around the world. Global public health, given how we screwed up the last one on um, the pandemic, uh, and nuclear non-proliferation, which I'll come back to in response to the question. So these areas of strategic cooperation are real, they're not imaginary, and we need a framework for our combined relationships with China, which create the political and diplomatic space to do that. Secondly, for us to then compete on as vigorously and as effectively and with uh, commonly accepted rules of the road um, and technical standards which are acceptable to open economies and, uh, and open societies. We should be competing, therefore, economically with China and in foreign policy terms where necessary and in values terms where necessary, but in a non-lethal fashion. And then there's a third set, uh, which is where uh, it gets much more challenging in areas of direct security challenge, including cyber, space, and competing and conflicting positions over the South China Sea, the East China Sea, which directly involves Japan, and of course Taiwan and the future nuclear stability of the Korean Peninsula. We can have a collective strategic framework, both among ourselves and openly with China, which accommodates the three above. Hard to do, but these three propositions are not as a matter of logic mutually exclusive. Uh, on the new question in particular, a very simple answer and short one is, Xi Jinping, through the PLA, in my judgment, has already communicated to the Russians, do not do that. <laughs> the Russian threat about the use of tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine would be a, f a total political and foreign policy disaster for China. And therefore, I would be deeply surprised if this message has not already been robustly communicated. And it's one of the reasons why I, and perhaps history will prove me wrong, believe this to be a hollow threat by Vladimir Putin delivered to intimidate the rest of us, frankly. Uh, on the third point, uh, on Germany and the historical experience of Nord Stream, Russia, gas, and in the future, uh, Germany's uh, export dependency on China and political leverage coming from that. I followed the debate um, uh, reasonably clearly here. Uh, can I say, as a matter of general stated uh, Chinese uh, global economic strategy, Xi Jinping has stated that their economic policy towards the world is to rely upon the gravitational pull of the Chinese economy across the world, simply as a product of its size. China is already the dominant trading partner of something like 140 states around the world. And uh, when you throw into that the infrastructure investment dependencies with the Belt and Road Initiative countries, China sees its strong card as, uh, is applying global economic leverage. My experience, however, from our country, where China uh, takes 28% of Australian exports, 28%, and therefore, if it stopped tomorrow, you would throw the Australian economy into a recession is that despite a fairly robust history that we have had in dealing with China directly on matters where we have radically disagreed, um, my experience is that China respects strength and is contemptuous of weakness. Remember, it's run by a party of Leninists who know a lot about strength and who know a lot about weakness. You've got a historical memory here of the DDR, for God's sake, um, the same intellectual kind of um, um, wiring so therefore, uh, be very mindful that that is China's general strategy, but the responsibility of the rest of us collectively, uh, who belong to open economies, open societies, open political systems, uh, is to respond confidently and with strength in response to the application of any such pressure. Um, diversification, of course, makes sense. Uh, and of course, the question of supply chains, to paraphrase what Xi Jinping said in the 20th, 20th Party Congress report himself, China is now moving its own supply chains to be much more compatible with China's long-term security interests. So for those who are concerned about 
this being a policy being adopted by other democracies and other economies here in Europe and the West, China is seeking to do uh, the same. And on the final question of the response to the BRI and can that be mobilised between the Europeans, between the Commonwealth um, and the crazy British now that they've left the European Union um, and all of that, um, my judgment would be the reason why China has such a large global footprint developed hugely effectively in a matter of only the last seven years since the effective launch of the Belt and Road Initiative in Beijing. And I remember because I was there when they did it. Um, and in the intervening years, we've tracked through the Asia Society Policy Institute $875 billion worth of state-sponsored infrastructure investment in target countries around the world. And what have we got to throw at it by contrast? Well, actually, the Japanese have the biggest uh, investment fund for infrastructure offered by non-Chinese sources. The Americans talk a lot about this, but throw very little at it, to be honest. Europe has come forward with a new and bigger proposal, uh, the name of which now escapes me. Um, and then, of course, we have this, these ancient institutions that we once paid a lot of attention to called the World Bank and the multilateral, multinational, multilateral development banks. My argument's pretty simple. You've got to have an alternative sort of source of cash. People want to develop their power infrastructure. They want to develop their renewable energy infrastructure. They want to develop their tel telco, their, their water resources. They want sanitation. They want all the things that have become manifest in the West. And there's a crisis of access to competitive capital around the world. Between us, surely we can collectively collaborate to deploy global public capital and global private capital through blended finance, through a pipeline of projects which actually makes a material difference by offering a real-world alternative, not just one that looks good in a brochure. Kevin, thank you very much. Usually around CPC party congresses, there's a lot of tea leaf reading, but you provided us with very sound and profound analysis and also with sharp political advice, at least in a very diplomatic manner. So thank you very much for this. And now over to you, Aliza.